Uh, as usual, we were running through uh, slideshows. These are submissions on the Facebook page over the last month or so. There's actually some really nice images being done by several people, um, which uh, I guess you will be looking at as we've been slightly past. Um, there's the usual um, solar pictures from Otto, some really nice stuff going on in there, and uh, senior super past. Still, what's going on, even though the weather's been so, uh, you would think there'd be no sky at all when <laughs> for everybody talking, but obviously there's been some because some people have been out there taking images. Um, hopefully, I'll get back into myself this month. So, same. Hopefully, I'm sick. So, yeah, just about to um, set up my new tarian to do some routine, which I haven't done for a very, very long time. I've got an autofocuser from somebody which I'm going to. Fits well, a strange Italian autofocus that I'm going to fit onto, uh, onto my new Italian, which should hopefully make that a bit more useful. Um, see, I've got a fair new few faces here I don't recognise. So, uh, hi, if anyone wants to make sure you say hello and uh, introduce yourselves, and uh, hopefully, make you regular visitors. Um, so, what I've intended to do for the, a chunk of tonight was a couple of people had asked if we could revisit looking at things as a beginner a bit because we've talked a fair bit about some of the more technical aspects this last year we had a couple of talks on more advanced software and we've had um, a bit of talk about planetary stuff but um, deep sky imaging with a telescope is really the, the core thing that people want to do every time we've asked that's what people are really interested in um, so this is a talk slideshow I've used I've been through and made some changes, but this I did this a couple of years ago, I think, since I did this. So it's probably not a bad idea to run through it again. A lot of you, it's pretty redundant stuff because you already know it, but <laughs> anyone want to speak up with any uh, good ideas, corrections, and uh, whatever, feel free to do so. And if anyone is completely new to it, hopefully this will be some use. Um, all right. Oh, God. I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> Does anyone not hate PowerPoint? It's not bad. Oh, it's been always bad. Okay, beginning to explain the Jingle Telescope is not by me. <laughs> what is the talk about? The talk is fundamentally about what is the real core of what we do with astrophotography. The real core of astrophotography is prime focus imaging with a tracking telescope and a camera, in this case a DSLR, but with a camera at prime focus on the telescope. Most of what I talk about, if I'm talking about cameras specifically, it's probably Canon, but pretty much everything translates to other DSLRs. Nikon, very, very popular. People use Sony as well, so there can be some, I guess, some issues with software on the PC and talking to it, but um, some very great cameras. Essentially, it's about getting to your first image and going, oh my god, I took that image of Orion. I can't believe it. Because everyone does that. The first time you get an image out of the Orion Nebula, it's that beautiful purple and blue. You just, wow, that's going to solve the whole thing to you. So. That's what it's about, understanding what the challenges are and how you can do it on the cheap, because you don't need to spend a lot of money. You don't need to spend no money, but you don't need to spend a huge amount of money. What is it's not about? I'm not talking about Whitefield, Milky Way, astrophotography, that's a talk for somebody else on another night. Greg's getting done a couple of talks on that, they're excellent, so we'll doubtless cover those at some point this year coming in. It's not about IP's projection, because that's just pointless. Um, it's not about using dedicated cameras and soft CCD, dedicated cameras and uh, associated expensive software. It's not about using Maxim with a dedicated camera. That's again, that's an advanced talk for people who've got the equipment, know what they're talking about. We have regular talks about that stuff. Um, it's not about producing professional quality images, it's about getting a decent image out of your own equipment. It's not about advanced post production, that's again another talk. And it's not about spending a lot of money. So, as a beginner, what can you hope to image? You can hope to image nebula. Nebula are the real the majority of the targets that you're really interested in. Like the very stars nebula. Bright nebula are the easy ones. Emission nebula, reflecting nebula. Dark nebula, you see images where there's all the dark clouds through things. A lot of those are very accessible. Planetary nebula, perfectly accessible, um, depending on what kind of telescope you've got. Um, bright nebula, we're referring to things like the Orion nebula, the Keyhole nebula, um, the Lagoon nebula. These are incredibly easy targets to take a picture of when you're starting. Um, much easier than you would think, I think, in a lot of cases. Galaxies. There are several large 
interleomedical galaxies in the southern sky. Um, not as many as there are in the northern sky, I think, in terms of galaxies. They've got a, we've got the, we get the better nebula, but we get the kind of weak end of the <laughs> stick on galaxies. But, uh, and there's several wide fields of galaxies where you can set up and take a picture and see 20 plus galaxies in your image. Star clusters, there's some open clusters, are quite easy to fake photographs of, but sometimes you wonder why you bother, because on photographs they look like some stars. <laughs> globular clusters are a great star to target. Um, we have a couple of the best globular clusters, uh, really high in the sky down here. Uh, Omega Centauri and 47 Tuganai, which are beautiful. Um, what kind of telescope can you use, depending on what you're going to photograph. If you have a SCT telescope, so that's like a slice from C8, or uh, the various schmidt cassegrain telescopes, that you have a hell of a lot around second hand. That's mostly going to take smaller objects. You're going to be zooming into a closer field, so uh, because it's a long focal length telescope, it's great for galaxies, the smaller nebula, or the core of the big nebula, but you're not going to get some big wide image of the whole Orion complex. So just so you're in terms of the language, difference between slow and fast. Okay, slow refers to, uh, essentially it refers to how long it's going to take to take the image, really. Um, okay. Because it's a, a slow telescope in that it's, that's probably not strictly true, but that's how I think you can interpret it. Uh, a slow telescope is one where it's a narrow field, um, so you're bringing in light from a smaller area, so you're bringing a lot less light onto the telescope but you're taking a higher resolution image effect. A fast telescope will be your Newtonian telescopes, your very short Newtonian telescopes, F4, F5, are referred to as fast telescopes. Um, the other images are very fast Newtonian, and they're really great. And they're a bit wider field. Um, I do my imaging when I'm on a motion on a schmidt cassegrain which is a much higher focal length, and it's a slower telescope. Uh, you can actually use a long lens instead of a telescope. If you've got a, you know, 400 millimeters, 500 millimeters camera lens, that's a, guess what, it's a telescope. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also get lots and lots of small refractive type telescopes, they're very popular for astrophysics. Little 90 millimeter telescopes this long, make superb astrophysics telescopes. Because they're very easy to use, you don't have any problems with collimation and all these things. They just take mm -hmm. But they're not very big, so they don't gather that much light, so you have to take longer exposures. Gotcha. <clears throat> so what type of telescopes and purposes? Schmidt Castle is great for smaller nebula, galaxies, globular clusters. Newtonian is great for larger nebula. There's, galaxies, there's not really any large galaxies in the mm -hmm. southern hemisphere, apart from the Magellanic Clouds. If you want to take the whole large Magellanic Cloud, your Schmidt Castle Grain is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But a short Newtonian, you, you might well be able to take a picture of the whole, or nearly the whole large mm -hmm. Magellanic Cloud, for instance. Um, and diffuse nebula, big nebula like the Orion Nebula. You'll see many pictures of the Orion Nebula where you see a little, the whole core of it, but you'll see other pictures where you see the whole thing and you see big loops of gas out in the field. They're great for you in your training. Camera lenses or mosaicing together images allows you to take much bigger areas. Things like the Pleiades or the whole Orion complex or the whole sky around Carina all in one go. <coughs> very, very quick look at what are some of the terms involved in astrophotography mean, and uh, you'll hear people talk about these all the time, and they're complete gibberish until you know what they are. Stacking inter or integration, what does that mean? Basically, when you take one picture from your telescope or your camera, you can see all the stuff on it, but it's noisy, and it's not that much, you know, there's, there's less detail than you hope to see, less actual information, less pictures than you hope to see, and lots of noise. Integration is the process of taking a whole bunch of images and effectively, for the math is much more complicated than that, averaging them together. So you take all those images, you average them out, and you find that all the noise that isn't the same in every image goes away. All the information that is the same in every image is all cleaned up and improved. And that's the signal, that's the actual picture you're trying to take. So the theory is the more frames you're integrating or stacking, the better your picture looks, the more information you can see. Signal to noise ratio, you'll hear the term all the time. You want to improve that. You want more signal, less noise. So that's why you're stacking or integrating lots of images. In order to do that, you've got to align the images perfectly. You've got to have some that analyze the images to make sure it uses the good ones, not the bad ones. And you've got to do the actual stacking. There are many paradigms that we use to do this. Most people who are doing SLR imaging 
on the cheap like me, you're using the digitized stacker because yeah. it's free and easy. That does it for all of that for you. Uh, however, there are Max and DL is more of a professional choice because it's quite an expensive piece of software. Pix Insight is immensely popular now. Uh, it costs money, but once you've got it, it, uh, it does a really amazing job. And we'll have we have had and will have more talks on using Pix Insight. If you want to get serious, that's really a route to go down. So initially, start with some of these by stacking it will do a great job for you. In order, before you do this stacking integration of your server, you want to get rid of all the rubbish out of the images that you can. This is where calibration comes in. Calibration means taking the image and saying, how do I remove all the crap in the image that I know is in there and it's predictable. If it's predictable, you can take it out. You have <coughs> random phone on noise. Can't be about that there. Camera noise due to heat in the camera and electronic noise. Can often be, can be removed. That's what your dark frames are. You take, take images with the camera lens on or with the telescope closed up so it's dark. Take the same kind of image you were taking of the sky and guess what, your image just contains all the things mm. the camera put there, it doesn't contain any image from the sky. So you can then subtract that from your real images and get rid of loads of noise. That's <coughs> the basis of that. There's other kind of various kinds of noise that will come out in the same way. There's something called flat fields, which telescopes aren't perfect. Your whole image and change all these bits of glass and things isn't perfect. You end up with, you might be familiar with the vignetting from normal photography, where it gets darker at the edges, that kind of stuff. Um, there's distortions, there's darkness, there's dust, bits of dust on your telescope that come out of big donuts on the image. You can remove all that, but then if you take what are called flat fields, which are a picture of an evenly illuminated surface or even the sky in twilight through the same telescope, exactly the same telescope you're taking your real pictures from, all of those features are still there, but the image isn't. So again, they can be removed mathematically later. So you take these extra images, and there's a few other kinds of images as well. Um, <coughs> so those are the things you do, those are the definitions of the basic processes that you use to put the image together and get to the image you're going to take into Photoshop or whatever. Um, what does prime focus mean? Prime focus, when all the light from the telescope comes together to a point, effectively, from one bit of sky it all kind of spreads out into the telescope and goes like this and comes to a point. That point there is prime focus. If you have an eyepiece, the eyepiece takes that and turns it into something that focus in your eye. Instead of doing that with a camera, you put the camera at that point. So all those points of focused light all come together. So the cam telescope is actually focusing on the sensor, just like it was a camera and you're focusing your lens on the sensor. It's a, clean, it's a clean, simple setup where you've got the telescope and the camera together. You're treating it just like the telescope with a big camera lens. Um, DSLR CMOS, a DSLR it's a little getting less important now, the whole distinction between a CCD and a CMOS. Used to be CCD meant serious camera, CMOS meant cheap rubbish. That was what people think thinking really. Um, just, it's not really true anymore. Um, the CMOS is in DSLRs, excellent, excellent quality sensors. Um, and a lot of the very similar sensors are used in quite expensive cameras now. When you cool them and put them in an astronomy camera, you can actually, they can be quite amazing things. So you can do pretty good. Uh, I'm not going to go into what CMOS and CCD actually mean because it's a bit of here, but if you've got a DSLR, your sensor is what's called a CMOS. Um, uh, it will also be a full colour sensor, which means it's a grid of red, green and blue cells. Uh, so when you take a picture, you're actually taking three pictures. You're taking a red picture, a green picture and a blue picture, all overlaid over each other at the same time. Your software is then going to take all that and strip it out and turn it into something sensible. DSLRs have small pixels. They have a high resolution because they're intended for taking very high resolution pictures. In astronomy terms, that means you get a very high resolution picture of the sky. It can be challenging depending on the telescope. You can find that it's too high resolution because you can't, your telescope setup isn't capable of really producing an image of that quality and you end up scaling your image down in order to avoid seeing a load of rubbish, um, basically. But that's great, you can. You can just quarter the size of the image and average it all out and lose all that. Um, if you're using a uh, dedicated camera, you can do something called binning, which does the same thing, which, but it does it before it gets actually processed. It just takes four pixels and turns it into one. You can effectively do that yourself. SLR, what it means with SLRs, though, is that you can take very high resolution images, which is actually really great when you're taking a nice image of a big nebula. It's really great to have a nice big image to play with rather than 
a few years ago, you were typically taking astro images of very, very small size, 800 by 800 squares, and that's not a lot of image. Mm -hmm. and it comes down to when you're taking things for a visual purpose as opposed to scientific purpose, that's not a lot of uh, actual image. So you've got a lot of image to play with. What kind of equipment would you use? Obviously, telescope. Pretty much any telescope, almost any telescope, is going to be able to be used for astrophotography. I've taken astrophotography images through a 90, big, long, cheap 90 millimeter refractor that is not really suitable, but you can still do it. It's not great, but it's what you've got. Most people are using either a Schmidt Cass and Grain, or if they've got lots of money, a Richard Cretien, and lots of time. Schmidt Cass and Grain, are the, is a, if it's about that big and about that long <laughs> and heavy, it's probably a Schmidt Cass and Grain. Got a big sheet of glass on the front, it's probably a Schmidt Cass and Grain. Um, there's a complex series of mirrors. Even though it's short, in reality, as far as the light goes, it's um, two meters long because it's all folded in the line itself. Um, you'll see tons of those about, probably what more, more people have probably got about than anything else, I suspect, in terms of astrophotography. Mm. Newtonian is a uh, big um, parabolic mirror at the bottom of a tube. So when you see your Dobsonians that people reuse, those are Newtonians. Shorter versions of those are very popular. If your focus is on the side of the telescope, it's usually a Newtonian or a modified Newtonian of some sort. Uh, they're very good cameras. Very good telescopes for photography of wider objects. If you see your, they produce images that have got um, spikes on them. So if your stars have got spikes on them, that's because of those veins holding the secondary mirror on the front of the Newtonian. They create the spikes and make pretty images. <laughs> and cover a few ills in your images sometimes as well. Um, refractors, small refractors. There's quite a few people here who specialise in small refractors. I haven't got one myself. Uh, for photography, they're better for brighter objects on the whole, uh, but they're very portable. If you want to set up that you're going to take out in the field somewhere or work out in nowhere, smaller, shorter refractors are very handleable, not so big and bulky. Um, and also have a fairly short focal length. I'll talk a little bit about that with the mounts. Uh, what kind of mount can you use for astrophotography? The answer is, as long as it tracks the sky, you can use any mount for astrophotography. It does need to automatically track the sky. It's really going to help you if it's a go-to mount that you can tell it what to point at because spending half an hour trying to find objects is, <laughs> yeah. is not what you want to do when you want to be out there imaging. So some kind of go-to tracking mount. If it can be an equatorial mount, you are definitely doing yourself a favour. It's much better for astrophotography. You can do astrophotography with alt azimuth mounts, especially if they're good, but you're going to be quite strictly limited in how long your exposures can be because... Mm. They're basically, if you use an old house on a mountain, it tracks the sky. Well, guess what? The sky's rotating and the mountain isn't. So the images over time will rotate. So you can take a sequence of images and they can be restacked together. Within one image, you can't have the image rotating a significant amount while you're actually taking a picture because you just end up with a blur. With the next order mount, the mount follows the sky exactly, so nothing in the sky rotates relative to the mount. So you can take images as long as you can make your equipment do. Um, Camera, almost any modern DSLR. If you're in Canon range, 450D plus, that's when they started putting proper USB control over, which is what you really need to be able to take images on your laptop from your camera. So whatever camera you've got, as long as you can go onto your laptop and go take some images and it'll take them, then you're good. You can use a remote shutter from like the one Gavin was just giving away to mm -hmm. take your images. You can go out with no, with no computer at all, set your telescope up with a camera, Tell it I want 10 60 second images, boom, and set it going. It's, it's not so controllable, it's more frustration, but if you, it's much less equipment and time to use that. It has its advantages. But ideally, remote USB capture and control from your laptop is going to be your friend. Computer, most people work on Windows. There are those who are using Macs who make it work. There are software out there that you can run on the Mac, or you can run Windows on the Mac these days. But basically, Windows with a laptop with multiple USB ports. <coughs> Various accessories you always going to need. USB cables that can go to your mount and your camera. Power supplies. All of these things are going to need power. Most people, if they're going to go out in the field, use back, use, you go to Super Super Auto and you get um, things for starting your car with. Well, they've got USB ports. They've got 12 volt cigarette lighter ports on them, which all the mounts take a 12 volt plug, so you can do it all from that. What was your own? 
Don't talk about the mouth choice. Um, would you recommend that to anybody here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll definitely talk about that in a second then. Yeah. Um, and a gamepad, super useful if you've got been controlled from the computer because they, you know, gamepads look like the little controllers. You can use that to move your mouse around in the sky. If you're looking at the screen and you can go out to touch the mouse, you can stand there point, you know, swinging the thing around with a handset. Saves you a ton of time. Uh, so, that's right. <laughs> That's my actual, this is my own uh, setup some time ago actually, but that's great. That's when I had it on a, I actually had a, uh, I bought the telescope, it came on a fork mount, which was mains operated, didn't do anything apart from sitting there ticking away at the sky, once you pointed it. I took some quite decent images with it initially. Um, it just meant you had to do all the pointing manually and then uh, that should go. Um, but I then put it on a, what is a, this second hand Skywatcher EQ6 mount, it's pretty much the, it certainly was until recently, pretty much the default astrophotography mount for a budget. It is an EQ6. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what the image is, right? You've got an EQ6R, you? Yeah. And so they're a, they're a great, solid, inexpensive, <coughs> you get them second hand. They've got great control from the PC end. Pretty much a really good starting <coughs> point uh, until you've got real money to spend. Um, how much you can get on four second hand just completely depends. Just don't get sucked into spending two grand on a second hand mount. They are very heavy to be bought. The HEQ5. This is true. If your main concern is carrying it around in the car and setting up in the field somewhere, the you probably want to go for a smaller mount. The yeah. HEQ5 five is much more manageable than the EQ6. It's not quite as stable, it's not quite as good a tracking, it's not quite because it's the smaller mount. But it's much cheaper and it's more manageable for carrying around. The EQ3 is even smaller and it's a perfectly good start amount with a small telescope on it as well, which you can pick up much cheaper. I sold one for $500 a couple of years ago, and hopefully the guys off doing photography with it, you know? Uh, well, I wouldn't sell that for $500, so. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, you had a question. Uh, define real money. Okay. Are we talking $50,000 or? <laughs> okay, so I'm out. Uh, let's have a guess. If you were looking for a second hand EQ6 mount online, then you're in the low to mid thousand margin, 1500 maybe, for a decent one for a decent second hand one of these. You can pick up an EQ5 second hand for maybe a thousand if you're lucky, mm -hmm. I guess. I mean, that, that seems fair to the people who keep an eye on the market. Um, mm -hmm. They get cheaper over time. These are, as time goes on, these are getting cheaper because there's more of them around and they're a little bit older. Um, you can go out there and get them out for way under a thousand. You can also go out <coughs> and cheerfully spend five or six thousand. Uh, and, and then others. basically the, the ceiling is on the prices. There is no ceiling on the price. The baseline on the price is you might be able to pick up an ZEQ25, which yeah. is, uh, or something like that for sub a thousand dollars second hand if you're lucky. Um, so that's kind of the baseline for a go-to amount that's tracked reasonably well. So I spent, I think about 1700 for that when I bought it, but it was, it came with some extras, like this, this extension pillar and a few other bits, so it was really not a bad deal. But that, I think I spent 1700 for mine. And it's tracked away brilliantly. I mean, it's never missed a beat since I put it in. Um, but if you have the money, you go for an EQR, right? Oh yeah, now, that didn't exist when I bought this, but I bought the second name. But yes, an EQ, then, then now there's improved versions. Again, it all depends on how much you want to spend. You can spend a little bit more and get the EQR, which is a belt-driven version of the same amount, which is a smoother tracking, better better tracking, definitely. What you found it good yet, the EQR, the EQ6R, you found that, that improvement worthwhile? Sorry? You find the R is worth the money? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Liam's. You've seen Liam's pictures of the, that speaks for itself. Um, the telescope itself, that again was very old. My telescope was probably made in the late 70s, I suspect. I bought it second hand on Dramey many years ago, um, but not a huge amount of money. Uh, you see people wanting a lot of money and you see people being more realistic. Um, you don't need to buy a big telescope. This is an 8 inch, which is a really pretty good starting point. Honest, and they're generally quite affordable. But the six inches telescope, a six inch SCT is fine, or something of that sort, or a 90 mm refractor, that's a decent one, or a six to eight inch Newtonian. So you got that reduced to F6 though with focal detail? Yes. Yeah. That's another, another point in this here. I'll just talk about what we've got on this. What you see on the picture here, this is my old, uh, uh, what was this one? This one's 60D, 60, I think. I had a 450D before, which functioned absolutely fine. You can pick up a second on 450D for peanuts now. 
I was just looking at online, 200 bucks for a cool case. Yeah. Exactly, people just selling this yeah. stuff off, you can get it, and it's perfectly decent, you can do perfectly decent images with a camera you bought for $300, don't trade me, no problem at all. Um, you got the telescope, you got an adapter here, which is your, your, this is one that's specific to the camera manufacturer, it basically turns that into a M42 screw that you can put a nose piece on and attach it to whatever they could, they, again, they can have for $15 for the adapters. They're really sweet and giving away cheap. Um, this is just the um, eyepiece holder that that's plugged into. This bit here is called a reducer. This makes this telescope a bit less long, because by default this is a two meter long telescope, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit unmanageable for a home setup for taking long, long exposure images. This little reducer, which again, I, got, I found second hand for, I can't remember, 90 bucks or 100 bucks or something, um, reduces that to, an f6.3 instead of f10, so much shorter, so 1.3 meters instead of two meters. It just means that you're, everything's less sensitive, the image is a little bit wider field, that kind of thing. Um, you see one here, that's a push-on autofocuser, push-on focuser, electric focuser, which again, guess what, I bought second hand. <laughs> I actually bought that at the Bring and Buy sale here, <laughs> here at the observatory a few years ago for almost nothing, and that's been quite a workforce as well. Uh, and that's my laptop in the corner. I've got this set up in a shed at home as an observatory, uh, so it's permanently mounted. But all of this could easily be done out in the field. We are talking just now, what I talked about there really was the imaging chain. So, as you can see, I've got the reducer, an adapter, the adapter for the telescope, for the camera, and there's a camera. Plugged in that so you can see now. For Newtonian, it's slightly different. You don't have a reducer on it, generally, because it's quite short anyway. Um, and you've just got, you may need, depending on what you're doing, you may even have a barlow, which is, barlow is like a magnifying lens, so make your image twice as high for location if you need it. Um, generally, these, your filters screw onto the end of one of your components. Um, we'll talk a little bit about filters. So that's what the imaging chain, when people say the imaging chain, it's the whole, it's the, where, the, where the light goes through before it gets to your camera sensor. 